Welcome back to Tree of Life Ministries. Once again, I'm your host, Pastor Paul Lancaster, and it is my privilege to uh, delve in the Word of God with you. Uh, now, before we begin, let me begin by just sharing just a couple of very quick announcements. First of all, uh, don't forget, next Sunday morning, May the 31st at 10 a.m., will be a rebirth service here at Tree of Life Ministries. We want to invite you, if you can, to come and join us. Uh, but to my to the church family at this time, you know, uh, prepare yourselves. You know, we still have a, another week uh, before we're able to meet. So pray about the service. Hold up the praise team and the, and the musicians. Uh, pray for, over the Word of God and, and pray over the service. But come exciting, excited. You know, we, we get to come back together and, and to be in the house of God. Come back with expectation, knowing that our God is more than capable to do anything. But most important, invite someone to come with you. Now, I know some of you may have concerns. As I shared uh, last week, uh, just know as we are in the process of preparing this service, we're going to take uh, whatever necessary steps uh, to honor and to maintain social distancing as much as possible. But we also have two concerns in this service. First, we want this service, and most important, we want this service to honor and to lift up and to praise and worship our God. That's first and foremost. The, the, the second most important thing, and it's right behind it, of course, is your safety. So just know we are taking whatever necessary steps possible uh, to ensure that safety so that we can have a very pleasant and worshipful uh, rebirth service. The second announcement I would like to share is to you, the viewer. I ask you to be patient with us as we transition back into our uh, facilities here, but also know uh, because of the overwhelming response and the views that we've had that it has piqued the interest of our board. Uh, we are beginning the process of, of, uh, uh, of what would be the next step in equipment and, and, and what things are necessary to produce one of uh, better video quality, but also to speed up production time. So that way we could continue to provide, which is what we uh, love, is to provide the Word of God to whomever would like to see it or hear it. And so we just ask for your patience. Uh, the messages will continue to come up. They just may be slightly delayed a day or two, but they will appear on our normal sites on Facebook at uh, Tree of Life Ministries of Newburn, but also on our YouTube channel. But at this time, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to the book of Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. Now, as you're turning to Genesis chapter 7, I just want you to simply note uh, today we're going to be, and you can kind of stay right there because we're going to jump between chapters 7, 8, and 9. Uh, there's a, a lot of nuggets, a lot of importance within those three chapters, but there are just certain pieces that I would like to um, uh, pull out, not that we're pulling them out of context, but I want us to focus on some very specific points. Uh, hopefully it will help us greatly understand the process that we are uh, experiencing at this time. But Genesis chapter 7, I'm begin by reading verse 15. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. This morning, I simply would like to bring a message I have entitled, Re Release and Resolve. Release and Resolve. When you begin to speak to parents, especially those who may be homeschooling at this time, uh, due to what, what is going on, and you see other people, it is very obvious that many people are growing weary at this time, and it's partially due to confinement. But this morning, I want us to consider Noah. You see, while we have simply 
separated ourselves for the brief period of 10 weeks. Noah and his family were confined inside the ark for a period of one year, 17 days. You see, while we seemingly, or many are using this phrase, I'm losing my mind, imagine living inside a boat for over a year. Consider the fact that sometime in that year, or, or you could even say during the voyage, someone has gotten on someone else's nerves. But they're in a boat, so they have nowhere to go. It's not like they can walk outside and walk in the yard. They, they just simply have nowhere to go. Think about also, how would you occupy yourself and your mind to keep you from losing your mind? See, many of us have watched many services. We've gone to our iPads, phones, ever how, you're, uh, how, ever how you view or watch, or we play games. Or Think about them at that time. How could they avoid boredom? Well, Scripture clearly teaches us that it was the Lord who shut the door. It was the Lord who determined the length of time they would be in the ark. But it was also the Lord who determined when this door would be open. Now, I'm a firm believer that these past 10 weeks were predetermined by the Lord. Similar to the case of Noah, it was a time of protection, yet a time in which we have been alone or should have been alone with God. Though considered a righteous man, that doesn't mean that Noah was a perfect man. He was simply found to be more righteous than any of the other inhabitants on earth at that time. So how Noah exited the ark was determined by what occurred within the confines of the ark. You see, upon our quote-unquote release, what we do next determines what we have learned while confined. You see, in this case, and it's the title of the message, Release and resolve go hand in hand. You see, during this time, hopefully, we have decided the course of action we are going to take next. We have begun to learn what our next step is going to be within the will of God. But we must also recognize our release. You see, just as God determined when Noah would be released, God is presently working out all the fine details of our release. It will be the moment when we are allowed to move, we are allowed to act, and we are allowed to flow freely on behalf of Almighty God. So in the next several days, what will happen is, and let me turn the title around, our resolve will determine our release. Look with me in Genesis chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Now what I'm about to share with you is either something I, I have just simply overlooked or I just didn't grasp it. See, we know that the waters receded and the ark itself rested on top of a mountain. In fact, Scripture indicates, and we just read it, that the tops of the mountains, plural, so not just the one that the ark rested on, but the mountains around the ark, and, and maybe as far out as they could see, all the tops of the mountains were now exposed. The water had receded that low. But yet, 
God had not released them from the ark. You see, the same ground that in 40 more days that the door would be opened and they would disembark is the same ground they were already looking at. What would have been the purpose of God keeping Noah and his family confined inside that ark for 40 more days? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, Scripture does not indicate exactly what happened within the ark during that 40-day period other than the fact Noah releasing you know, the raven first and then the dove. Past that, we, we don't know what happened within that ark. But there is a scriptural pattern determined by a 40-day period. Because in Scripture and from the Bible, a 40-day period signifies a period of testing. You see, in the period of testing, it begins to reveal something to that individual or even a group of people and it reveals something about themselves or, or what they may have endured or went through. But a 40-day period can also signify a period of judgmental testing. In other words, and we'll, and we'll touch on that here in a little bit, is like when the children of Israel disobey God during a certain period of time, a 40-day period of time, well, they had to wander the wilderness for 40 years, one year for every day of disobedience. So there was, uh, uh, so we see it judgmental, like upon a nation, or testing and judgment on an individual. At this time, I shared earlier, we have been quarantined for 10 weeks, seven days in a week. So at the time of you viewing this message, we will have been quarantined 70 days. Viewing this in light of what is known as Jewish gematria. And for those of you who may not know, gematria is just simply an alphanumeric code of assigning a numerical value to a name, word, or phrase, and it's based on the letters of that word. Now, what should we have learned prior to our release? How about our, our, our 70 day period? You know, what is it that we should learn? Well, first of all, when you look at 70 in the gematria, it has several meanings, and I want to share them with you right now. You see, during our period of our lock in, 70 begins to denote many of the names of God. Because the one letter or word that makes up 70 in Gematria is Yah, Y-A-H. It is one of the holy names of God. It is like a base root or root name for multiple names of God. So during this time, you should have learned Him as Jehovah God, Yahweh. You should have learned Him as Savior, Redeemer, Healer, Provider, my all in all. So you should have learned what the multiple names of God were. How, and how they apply to you during this moment of time. But it is also during this time, not only is God revealing Himself to us, but God is attempting to draw us to Him. Because 70 can also represent a watchtower. And see, while many are complaining, I don't know why we have to be confined to our homes and why we don't have to go out. What is God revealing to us about Himself? He's saying, I am your watchtower. When times get rough, the enemy comes in, plagues, pestilences, these things continue to increase and get worse, and they will according to Scripture. God is saying, not only am I Yah, not only am I the covenant-keeping God, but I am also your watchtower. I am the one in which you can run. I am the one in which you can trust. I am the one who will hide you in the shadow, the pinions of my wings, and protect you from all harm. So we have learned, or should have learned, that He is a place of safety, and He is a place of refuge. Seventy can also show us that God is the judge of this world. Man may pass laws that we don't agree with. Man may say that there is no God. 
Men may try to, uh, to rise up certain symbols and emblems that, 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 that would try to push God and push the church out of the back corner. But God said, I will bring their plans to nothing because I am God Almighty. He is the one. It says that the earth is his footstool. As he sits on his throne, everything is under his authority. Everything is beneath whom he is. And God is the judge of all things. But it is also during this time that we, as the body of Christ, should have experienced God as our comforter. The phrase, us losing our minds, should have never come out of our mouth because we're giving the enemy way too much credit. You see, it's during this time I have felt the arms of my God wrap around me and give me peace. I have felt His love and kindness at times I was isolated and felt alone and as if nobody cared. But I have learned that He is my comforter. He is my Prince of Peace. He is wonderful. And He is my God. See, while attempting uh, to stay the course, and, and we've got to stay in context of what we're learning this morning. I share with you what our 70, our period of time. But what does the 40 mean? You know, Noah was locked inside this heart for 40 more days. What does 40 represent according to Scripture? Well, someone once said, God has perfect timing. Never early, never late. It takes a little patience. And it takes a lot of faith. But it's worth the wait. You see, I believe that part of that 40 days that Noah had to remain inside that ark is to teach Noah and his family patience about waiting on the Lord for the next step about not trying to rush and get ahead of God the Bible even speaks of how patience is a virtue and see Noah learned patience while he awaited for God to open the door you see, too often we mess our lives up and really the lives of other people because we try to rush to wheel in the plan of God. We try to force a door open. But God's saying, you do not determine when the door opens. Scripture even says that He is the one who opens doors and He closes doors. And He is the one who possesses the keys of David. So what should we have learned during this time? Patience. We know Isaiah 40 and 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What does it mean to renew? It means to change. You see, that seems to be reoccurring and continue to come up last week and this week. God is about to do a new thing. And during this period of time, God is renewing us. That's why we must be patient. There's something He's springing up and springing forth from us. There's something that He's changing about us because He is about to reveal the next step. You see, as God is the one who opens the door... It's because God is the one who knows what is coming, what lies ahead. He also knows the strength that is required to accomplish what is coming. That's why I also believe not only is this a period of patience, or to teach patience, but this has also been a period of rest. To get ready for the next big move of God. See, it's during these quiet times... God has been preparing us and molding us and getting us ready because that what, I, what was the definition of renew? To spring up. There are going to be people, the Bible says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There are some who have sought the applause of man and the pat on the back. But God says, but those who wait on me, they shall be renewed. Though they may seem last now in the, man, in the eyes of man, God said, I'm about to bring them to the forefront. They are the ones that I'm going to use in this next move of God. You see, it is renewed. It's better 
than what we've had. It's better than what we've already experienced. God says, I know you enjoyed what I've done for you before, but just wait and see what God can do next. When the church returns, it should be a renewed and rejuvenated strength. What does He say during this time? What is also? It's a time to wait. Writer of Psalms says that for evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. You see, there is no way we can begin to understand everything that has transpired or why we've endured what we endured or, or why did this even go on? Who would have even thought this would have happened in America? But what I am assured of by Scripture, those who wait, patiently wait on the Lord, they have the promise that we will receive an inheritance. You see, it is more than strength. It is more than a new thing. It is more than, than, than us trying to make it through this world and, and make it to the return of our Lord and Savior. But we have waited patiently on the inheritance of eternity with Him. A place that He has prepared for us. God said, let the evil make their plans, but I've got you. Let the evil devise all they want to to try to tear you down, but I'm the one who will build you up. Acknowledge me in all your ways and see what I can do for you. See that I don't raise you up. Watch what I can do through a people who are obedient and who wait upon the Lord. In Exodus chapter 24 verse 18, And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. See, there's a pattern through Scripture, and that's what I'm beginning to reveal as we continue to build. First God, the first 40 was Noah. Patience, waiting on the Lord, seeing what the Lord can do. Now we've made our way to Moses, and here's what's awesome about Moses, because it's also a picture to me of the rapture. God came down, but Moses went up, and he met his Lord in the air. You see, Moses received something he had not seen before. And this is what the second 40 represents. He received a new revelation of who God is. The writer of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. See, Moses received a revelation. What, what, what's the revelation? It's the process by which God discloses the divine nature and the mystery of a divine will and His purpose to human beings. That's revelation. Remember I, earlier I told you we had been quarantined for 70 days? And I told you that the 70 in Gematria represents the names of God and a watchtower. Well, see, that is God disclosing His divine nature. You see, during this time, we should have received a new revelation of who our God is. Well, you're asking yourself the question now, how can I know? How did He reveal these things to me? First of all, He did it through the Word of God. That's why we continued these videos. That's why we continue to present the Word of God. Is because we wanted you, the viewer, to receive a revelation of who God is in your life and what He's doing right now. So God revealed Himself through His Word. How else does God reveal Himself? He reveals it through nature. You only have to go outside and look at nature and look what's going on around you and come to the understanding that only God could have created what we see. See, nobody can explain how a bumblebee flies or a hummingbird, how they can hover. But God created them for a specific purpose. You go look at the mountains and how they've been pushed up and go to the ocean. We're, we're close to an ocean. And, and you go to the ocean and you see the seas and the waves and, and the sand and the beauty of the ocean. And when you see these things, you come to the understanding and the revelation, there is a God. His Word says, 
He is the one who told the seas where to stop and where for the land to begin. And when you go to the ocean, you can see that boundary. God speaking through nature. But most important, our God speaks to us through and by His Son. That His Son came down and took on flesh, dwelt among us, died for us, so that one day we could be with Him. So there is a revealed truth of God. But see, God says, I'll reward those who seek me. Not just seek. Diligently seek. You know, He wanted to spend time with Adam in the cool of the morning and the cool of the evening. That's twice a day. You see, during this time, it should have been very easy for us to get up in the morning, the cool of the morning, and spend time with God. And before we go to bed at night, instead of saying our little, uh, now I, I lay me down to sleep prayer, that is when we begin to really pray and seek God before we in the cool of the evening and spend time and diligently seek Him. You see, with Revelation, there comes a greater understanding of who God is. In Jeremiah 33 and 3, and this is from the New Living Translation, it says, and this is God talking to us, Ask me, and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Those that expect to receive from God persist in prayer. They get revelation of who God is. But as we ask, God says, I will reveal. I'll give you understanding. Throughout His Word, promises are given. And they're not superseded. But these promises are given to quicken us and to encourage us to continue to dig, to continue to seek, and continue to pray. Call on God. Ask Him. Whatever it is that is on your heart, He already knows. He's just waiting for us to ask. But when you ask, expect God to reveal Himself to us. Well, many people would say, well, you know, I haven't seen a burning bush. Well, you know, according to the Word of God, there was only one burning bush. There was only one man who was swallowed by a whale. God is going to reveal Himself to you according, one, to the level of your knowledge, but also to who you are, your nature and your characteristic. There was only one Moses. There was only one Jonah. And there's only one you. And God is going to reveal Himself to you specific to who you are. Call on God. Not just when you're going through something. And not just when you need Him. But asking God what is about to come. Reveal yourself to me. You see in Numbers chapter 13 verse 25. It says, And they returned from spying out the land for 40 days. You see, this was the first time that the nation of Israel had passed through the wilderness. They were on the precipice of going and claiming the promise that God had given them about inheriting a land. But instead of trusting God with that promise, they sent spies into the land for 40 days. And these spies came back with a report. And that report uh, was, you know, uh, about uh, the giants, about the land, and about the cities. And you see... God had already said, I'm going to give you the land. But what hindered them and what hindered God from blessing, and this is where they ended up traveling in the wilderness for 40 years. Unbelief hindered God from blessing His people. You see, this is also a time that God uses to expose in us what is hindering Him from using us to the fullest. Or what might be hindering us from receiving our miracle or our breakthrough. You see, I shared with you there are three things that those spies came back with in their report, but they represent something in our life. The first thing they spoke about was strong opposition. You see, like the Apostle Paul would often say, he said, I battled, and he called it a thorn in the flesh. You see, there are certain people in our life and individuals we encounter that for whatever reason, they're just negative all the time. They never see the good in anything. They complain about everything. Or they, they come and they speak to us 
And the words get into our thoughts and into our minds. And it has a very negative, it's a constant thorn in our flesh. It continues to buffet us. It continues to drag us and to pull us down mentally and, and physically, spiritually as well. And these people have a negative cognition over our life. Now, somehow they've created a stronghold. They're a very strong opposition. And see, because of their negativity and because of how they come at us all the time, it becomes an irritant to our spiritual vision. And when it becomes an irritant, what begins to happen is it hinders our understanding, which is what I just spoke about, the revelation of who God is and what He's doing. And so they begin to hinder our understanding. Paul writes in Ephesians, Let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, which He worked in Christ, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Paul is praying, let us, God, give us this understanding. See, we, we, I just told you, pray and ask. And the last time we talked about was understanding. Well, how about, let's get specific. What type of understanding or one type that we should be praying for? Father, enlighten us as to what Christ has done, but the authority that Christ has as well. Because he says, everything is under his dominion, anything that is named. Not only in th this age, which is the age uh, that we live in now, but also the age to come, which is eternity. Christ has all authority. So why should we allow these people to continue to buffet us? Our God has all authority. He has dominion. He has the power. And when we get to the revelation understanding of who He is then these people, this opposition, doesn't bother us anymore. We move past them. But they said there was a second thing that caused doubt and unbelief, and that was the walled cities. See, these walled cities are spiritual barriers. And these barriers, their intent and purpose is to keep out the blessings of God, but to keep the strongholds in. So while uh, we are dealing and getting buffeted by this strong opposition, we have these walled cities, these barriers that are keeping out the blessings of God, but they continue to bind us and to confine us in our homes, in our minds, in our spirits. What are so many strongholds? Bitterness, unforgiveness. How about strife? Constant contention. You see... All of these are walls that we often build up as, depending on how people treat us. But God gave a very specific command and they were later carried out. My friend, it was Joshua who wanted to take the land to begin with. He would come back and God would tell him how you break down these walls. He says when you go in there, the first city they met was one that had the thickest walls of them all. And God says you march around that city and when I tell you, you blow the horns and you shout with a shout and watch me tear the strongholds down. You see, that's why it's important that we return to church as a rebirth ready to worship our God. Because when we return, I know there's some people, you're going to bring strongholds. There's going to be walls or barriers. There's going to be things that the enemy has done to try to hinder you from the blessings of God. But we're going to come in here together. We're going to come in an agreement together. And we're going to get in, uh, whether this altar, ever how we do it that day, or ever how God moves, and we're going to come into agreement. We're going to march around those walls. We're going to shout and praise and worship at those walls and watch God tear them down. The final thing was giants. He said there were giants, and we view ourselves as grasshoppers in their sights. What is a giant in your life? It's some sort of negative problem that forms a mental image in our minds that whatever it may be appears too large for us to conquer. Well, let me go ahead and assure you of something right now. It doesn't matter what you face. It's too big for you anyway. But if our dependence is upon God, and we're trusting Him for everything. It doesn't matter how big, how small and insignificant we think that it may be. It is under the authority of our God. And our God says, you let me determine the outcome. 
Let me handle your problems. Let me shoulder your burdens. I, I was just talking to a friend of mine, and, and, he, and I've said this many times in our church, but he brought it back to my remembrance. He says, you know, I took and I've laid this on the altar of God. God, you determine the outcome. God, you determine what is happening and what is going on in this. He said, but the problem is, I keep wanting to go back and pick it back up. You see, that's our problem. We've got to lay it on the altar of God. Call out to our God. Ask Him to handle our problems and entrust and know that our God can handle any giant that stands in our way. See, we're viewing it in light of who we are. That's why we appear as grasshoppers to whatever problem we face. But when we begin to view the things from the throne of God and from where our Lord sits, everything else looks small. Because He is the one who is all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, and He is the one who determined, who determined the end or the beginning from the end. He knew what was going to happen, but He also knows what's going to happen. Let me read to you the last, and let's get into the last 40 here. And that's found in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You see, forty days, remember I told you, was a period of time in which God gave before His judgment would come against the city. God gave the people a period of time for retrospect. In fact, the governor of Nineveh called for the entire city for 40 days of prayer and fasting. History in the Bible teaches us that this city repented and God relented His judgment. You see, it is during this time that though we are in our homes, we should have been united in prayer, say, asking God to open our eyes of this nation to our present condition. Open the eyes of our president. Open the eyes of our governors, our senators, and our representatives. Let them see the present state of our nation and our need for God to come in and to move in a mighty way. You see, we need to be praying for revival. You know, we need to be asking ourselves this question because it's a time of repentance. God, have I left my first love? Have I left you? Have I placed other gods before you? Am I doing all I can do for the glory of God? Is what I'm doing for your glory or is it for mine? What do I desire spiritually? John 3.17 tells us, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world he, men might be saved. See, it would be unfair for God to judge the cities of the Bible, Sodom, Gomorrah, Nineveh, these different cities, for their sins, but allow ours to go unpunished. You see, Peter records that God knows how to save us from the judgment to come and to reserve the unjust for punishment. If you have not already, and I don't know your spiritual condition, now is the time to ask God to search your heart and mind. And just simply ask you, God, forgive me for what I have done. For putting my life and everything else ahead of my relationship with you. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 says that Noah built an ark to the Lord and took every clean animal, every clean bird and offered them on an altar to God. I have conversed with many people and I have posed this question. What will be the first thing you do once this quarantine is concluded? Some have responded they're tired of home-cooked meals and cannot wait for restaurants to reopen. Surprisingly, many have no clue what they want to do. In fact, a couple of people said, I haven't given it a thought. My hope is that we respond in a similar fashion to Noah. You see, when he and his family were finally released to disembark the ark, the first thing Noah wanted to do is he built an altar. And if you will recall, release is the act of of allowing something to move, act, or flow freely through you. What better way for our church family to experience release than at the altar of God? You see, they were permitted to flow freely in the presence of God because it was God who brought them through the storm. For all that God has done for us and through us, I cannot think of a better way 
to celebrate our release than when we can come together in His house to worship Him. Not as separate individuals in our homes, but corporately as one family, the body of Christ. To come into this place and to praise and to worship the one who has seen us through every storm. The one who is preparing us for what he is about to release on the face of this earth. The one who is the watchtower who kept us from all harm. The one who has supplied all of our needs according to his riches and glory. The one who died for us. The one who has gone to prepare a place for us. I don't know about you. But I cannot wait to experience His presence corporately. I cannot wait to witness His power transforming lives. I cannot wait to praise and to worship the One who has called us out. But see, we just cannot come to this altar in any fashion. You see, we've got to come as Noah did. We've got to come with an attitude of gratitude. In 1 Thessalonians 5 uh, verses 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. You see, we've got to come into His house with gratitude. Not mumbling, grumbling, and complaining because of what has or has not happened, but come in saying, God, you know, in all things, the good, the bad, and the indifferent, I'm going to praise You. I'm going to work it. See, that's where we have to resolve how we're going to be released. I am resolving right now for my, me and my family and for this church that we are not going to come back through those doors the same way we left, but we're going to come in grateful to our God who has redeemed us and brought us through everything. Scripture says in uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, that when Moses, I mean Noah offered these things on the altar, that they were a sweet-smelling aroma to God. It was pleasing to God. You know, our sacrifices uh, to, to our God are songs of praise because God has fulfilled all His vows and we realize that our salvation comes from God alone. We come to worship God. Deuteronomy says, He alone is our God, the only one who is worthy of praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that we have seen with our own eyes. People remember everything God has already done for us. Remember the miracles we saw before we were confined. It doesn't matter. Everybody's testimony is different. But what we have witnessed is God moving and working in our lives and through our church. He is the only one worthy of worship. He is the only one worthy of praise. Look, for too long we've worshipped everything else. Now it's time to put everything else in its place and worship the one who has been trying to reveal himself to us. We've come to the realization he is our all in all. See, Noah laid everything on the altar. And he thanked God for his family. He thanked God for his protection during the storm. And he thanked God for using him. You see, have you ever thought about that? As a father and as a husband, I have laid my family on the altar of God. There have been times I've had to thank my God for his hand of protection on us and for providing for us. And I don't know what God has in the future. But I'm already thanking Him for using us. Let me close with this. And this is found in Genesis chapter 9, verses 12 through 13. He said, This is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign for, or, of the covenant between me and the earth. See, see there was a covenant agreement that God made with Noah that is unconditional and perpetual. You see, He promised that He would never destroy the earth with water again. And as far removed as we are from this event, we are still the recipients of this covenant agreement. So we have the assurance because of that agreement, and we still see it today, we have assurance and we have hope. 
that if God is faithful to keep that promise, then He is more than able to keep all His promises. You see, mankind has tried to pervert the image of the rainbow. And God used the rainbow as a sign of an agreement between Him and mankind. There is only one way in which we can view a rainbow. You see, the sun must be behind us. The rain must be in front of us. And as light passes through the water droplets and it's refract refracted back towards us, then we're allowed to see the rainbow of the light spectrum. You see, it doesn't matter what we face. We have a, an agreement with God. And it is relative to our position with the Son who is always behind us. Scripture says it's the glory of the Lord who is behind us. You see, the Lord is our rear guard. The reason we're able to see and remember this covenant agreement of this rainbow is because the illumination of the Son of God as it passes through the rain. Remember, rain in Scripture is symbolic of the Holy Spirit of God. So when we receive the illumination of our covenant agreement and the sun is behind us, it's being, His light is being refracted through His Spirit that dwells within us. You see, I also believe this is going to allude to what we're about to witness. Because salvation has been provided by the sun. As Joel 2 outpouring is about to take place, which means the rain is out ahead of us and the rain is coming. See, I can hear the sound of the abundance of rain, which means that the promise of His return is nearer than what we realize. You see, when we know the sun is behind us and the outpouring begins to happen and His light reflects through it, we're going to see the Son of God step out on the clouds and to call His people home. What we are beginning to witness right now, and I hope you realize this, is the fulfillment of all the prophecies which predicted events that would occur before the rapture. Get ready for the release. Get ready for God just to let everything go. Get ready to experience Him to the fullest. If you would bow your head and let's pray. Father, if there are any who are viewing this right now, I pray heavily, Father, Lord, that you begin to minister to them right now. Father, begin to lift them up. Have your hand on them, God. I pray, Father, Lord, they, that they receive the illumination of who you are. And that, Father, when they get this understanding that, God, they call out to you. They admit that they're a sinner. They ask you to be Lord and Savior, and they receive the free gift of salvation. Heavenly Father, when the church of uh, your church begins to return whenever those times may be. I pray we learn the lessons that we should have uh, uh, learned during this time. Patience. What may be hindering us. Revelation. But most important, Lord, repentance. Lord, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I pray you forgive us of our shortcomings. But help us remember the covenant agreement that we have with you. That, Lord, that when we believe in you, Lord, we have the promise of a hope and a future and eternity with you. Father, I pray prepare us as we begin to return to our respective churches and let our massive rebirth and revival begin to take place that brings honor and glory to your holy name. And I ask all this in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Once again, it was my pleasure to be with you uh, coming in through... Uh, one of these media outlets. Uh, pray for us as we meet again next week. We'll uh, continue to place these videos and, 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 and hopefully uh, continue to be able to feed you uh, through the Word of God where are you at. Uh, but at this time, I just pray that the Lord bless you and keep you, and we look forward to being with you again next week.